Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, please stand with me as we prepare our hearts together for worship. church that desires to grow in holiness together. Uh, today's theme is all about, once again, reconciliation. And I wonder what the church would be like if we took what Jesus says to us seriously. When he says, if you're on your way to give an offering to God, and on your way you remember that a brother or a sister has something against you, Leave your, leave your gift at the altar. Go and first reconcile, make things right, and then come back and worship God. So as we worship this morning, I pray that God will be, begin to work in our hearts and show us the areas and the relationships in our lives that need His healing touch, that need to be dealt with, that need to be made right. Please join me in a responsive call to worship this morning. From different lives, we come to worship you. From good weeks and bad weeks, we come to worship. Bringing great times and painful memories, we come to worship. Needing healing, needing peace, we come to worship. With hope in our hearts, we come, we come to worship. To the Almighty God, we come to worship. To the King of Kings, we come to worship. And together, we come to worship. Call him Jesus, he came to love, he lived for him, he lived and died, to buy my pardon and empty. 
Change it someday for us. 
my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange Exchange it some for a prayer. Please be seated. a place where streams of grace flows deep and wide. All the love I've ever found comes like a At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe. you
save my life Here I bow down Here I bow At the cross, at the cross I surrender my life I'm in awe of you I'm in awe of you Where your love ran red And my sin washed white I owe all to you I owe all to you At the cross, at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you Where your love ran red And my sin washed white I owe all to you I owe all to you Let's pray. Lord, at the cross, we come to surrender this morning. At your cross, we come to surrender our pride, our selfishness, our anger, our hatred, our pains, our unforgiveness. Lord, you forgave us for so much more. Lord, you forgave us for an eternity of judgment. So Lord, we come to you this morning for your eternal perspective as we open your word, as we hear your word to your disciples. May we hear that same voice in our own hearts as you speak to us about the matters of the heart. Open up our hearts this morning as we come to you in worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with me for today's scripture reading. <coughs> We are continuing in the Sermon on the Mount series, and this week we are in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 26. This week I chose to read to you from the Message Translation. You're familiar with the command to the ancients, do not murder. I'm telling you that anyone who is so much as angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. Carelessly call a brother idiot and you just might find yourself hauled into court. Thoughtlessly yell stupid at a sister and you are on the brink of hellfire. The simple moral fact is that words kill. This is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter your place of worship and about to make an offering, you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you. Abandon your offering. Leave immediately. Go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then, come back and work things out with God. Or say you're out on the street and an old enemy accosts you. Don't lose a minute. Make the first move. Make things right with him. After all, if you leave the first move to him, knowing his track record, you're likely to end up in court, maybe even jail. If that happens, you won't get out 
without a stiff fine. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, speak to us about murder. Speak to us about your prohibit your prohibition of the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder. Speak to us and reveal to us and shine your light into our hearts today and reveal our anger that we have towards our brothers and sisters. Reveal to us the sin that is within our hearts that is equivalent of murder. Reveal to us that to you, a holy God, even if we don't move, even if we don't carry things out into the open, into actions, it is just the same, just as ugly, and just as sinful. And Lord, you want your people to be healed and cleansed from the inside out. May we listen to your voice today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> Here is a note, a real note, that a fourth grader, a fourth grade girl, received from a classmate at school without any provocation. I haven't corrected the spelling errors. As you read it, try to imagine the impact of such words. Awful Janet, you're the stinkiest girl in this world. I hope you die, but of course I suppose that's impossible. I've got some ideals. Play in the road, cut your throat, drink poison, get drunk, knife yourself. Please do some of this, you big fat girl. We all hate you. I'm praying, oh please, Lord, let Janet die. We're in need of fresh air. Did you hear me, Lord? Because if you didn't, we'll all die here, with her here, from Wanda Jackson. The old saying, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me, is simply dead wrong. I have experienced firsthand that words can indeed hurt and even kill. And I'm sure you have experienced much pain at the words, careless words of anger, careless words hurled at you, careless insults written online or sent to you in a private message. Like venom spewing out of a viper, words can sink its fangs deep into our hearts and inject such hateful thoughts that all you can think about is how worthless your life is. Character assassination and the assault on one's spirit through verbal denigration is often the worst form of pain. And today, Jesus has something important to say to us, his believers, his followers, about such anger and hatred and careless words that we throw out into this world. This week is the first of the six corrections that Jesus gave against the prevailing views of his time. And it begins with the phrase, you have heard it said. After talking about how he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law perfectly, <coughs> Jesus wants to address the perversion and misunderstanding of God's law on the part of the Jewish people, on the part of the scribes and Pharisees, who were the leaders and shepherds of the people. There were many teachings during Jesus' time that were simply misleading, harmful, and wrong. And Jesus sought to rectify that which 
have been reduced and watered down to mere external actions. And if anyone had the right to explain the law, it was Jesus. Being the one with the Father, the law giver, the one who knew God's perfect intention behind giving us all of the law, Jesus sought to address all of the sins, all of the garbage that the sixth commandment prohibited. Thou shalt not murder. And using this sixth commandment as the foundation, Jesus addresses an extension of that sin, the, or the origin of that sin of murder. Where does murder come from? It comes from anger. He wants to deal with the root cause of what motivates mankind to commit murder. What motivates a little girl in fourth grade to write such a note to another girl just because of her appearance, just because maybe she's popular, just because maybe she thinks she has the power to take out her anger on someone else. There are two words in Greek for anger. There's a word that describes the quick burst of anger that we experience when we temporarily lose our cool. The anger that surges then subsides. Maybe sometimes when you're driving and someone cuts you off. Or maybe when your child throws his supper right at you. And then there's a different kind of anger. There's a, there's a word in Greek that describes a deep-seated animosity that festers. The long-lived anger which a person nurses and will not let die. This is the anger that fan continually, taking that we fan continually, taking it from a small smoldering ember into a raging fire of bitterness and resentment. It's kind of like lighting a campfire. This kind of anger is fueled often by a some small kindling of thoughts of resentment, unforgiveness, and hatred. But then those thoughts grow bigger and bigger. Those kindlings become little branches, become bigger branches, and eventually they become logs that burn and rage on inside of us. And we devote our energy to keeping this anger active and intense. And we constantly remind ourselves of how wrongly we have been treated and offended by our perpetrator. And biblically speaking, there is such a thing as righteous anger. Everything until now has been unrighteous anger. Jesus displayed righteous anger in the temple with the money changers. Righteous anger proceeds from the love for God and of God and the love of others, even the person who has wronged you. Evil anger proceeds from self-love, from dislike or hatred of others. Righteous anger aims for God's glory against sin because God is dishonored in the sin displayed and for our brother's good, for their welfare, that they may be corrected, that they may repent, and they may, be, they may go down the path of righteousness. Whereas evil anger seeks to please the self and fulfill desires for revenge, and payback. So the reference of Jesus then to anger today is about unrighteous anger, selfish anger, the anger of pride, vanity, hatred, malice, and revenge. Any anger 
that is motivated by selfishness is unrighteous in God's sight. Any anger that does not seek to uphold the love of God and hatred of sin is unrighteous. There are three words, interesting words, three key words in today's passage that I would like to go over with you. There is this word that the message version uh, translates to uh, idiot. And if you look at other Bible translations, you will see a Aramaic word, raka, often. If you insult someone saying raka is what it says. And roughly speaking, the Aramaic word raka means empty. And it seems to be a common insult of the time. Like when someone ticks you off or when someone kind of rubs you the wrong way, that's what you might call that person under your breath, raka. And of course, in the English, the message or Eugene Peterson thought idiot kind of fit. It's an insult to someone's intelligence, calling them empty headed, a nitwit or a numbskull. And such an insult, Jesus says, was liable for judgment by the Jewish court of the time. Such an insult was an offense against God who created people in his own image. And so you could, you could potentially be tried in court for insulting someone that way. And then there's another word that we, that other translations often translate into the word fool. This is the last of the example where if, if, where Jesus says, if you call someone a fool, you are at the risk of the fires of hell. The message translates it as stupid, not very different from the word idiot. Many scholars think, though, that this word fool in Greek was sort of a more severe insult that questions not only one's intelligence but calls into question their own dignity and self-worth. And many argue that Jesus is establishing three different degrees of murder that require an increasing and more severe judgment. But I have a hard time accepting such an interpretation given the surrounding context. I'm not so sure that Jesus is trying to say which insult is worse than another and which insult is is subject to the fires of hell versus human courts. That is not the point that I think Jesus is trying to make. And then there's the word fires of hell. And in, in, the, in the original text, it actually doesn't say fires of hell. It refers to a place called Gehenna, <coughs> which is always translated to hell in one sense or another in the New Testament. And it refer Gehenna references a valley immediately southwest of Jerusalem that is still visible from the Mount of Olives to this day. And at one point in history, it was the place where human sacrifices were made to the pagan deity Moloch. And this is what uh, is referenced in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles and by Jeremiah. And when King Josiah brought religious reform to the nation, Gehenna was condemned and came to be used as a garbage dump for the city of Jerusalem. And it was a garbage dump where they burned garbage continuously, 24 hours, 7 days a week, to this day. And in addition to garbage, the corpses of criminals considered unworthy of burial were piled there. The smoldering fires of Gehenna never went out, and its flames still go on to this day by the continuous supply of garbage. In Jesus' day, Gehenna was a visible representation of what hell, of, of hell, 
or what people imagine to be hell. So having said all this, <coughs> we now have to come to terms with what Jesus is saying to us and wrestle with it today, because that's the hard work. In our minds, murder is clearly so much worse and more evil than angry thoughts and insulting words. In our society, we treat it with a much greater severity. You might serve a life sentence in jail for murder, but you probably won't even spend the night in jail if you were to do so with your words. In fact, our society would probably be in chaos if we were to begin judging everyone's angry thoughts and insults. Yet Jesus today corrects this misconception for the church. He's saying, the world may not care what you say and what you think, but I do because God does. He teaches that the spirit of the sixth commandment touches beyond physical act of murder. Do not commit murder is a commandment that from God that sheds light upon the ugly, festering, smoldering anger inside of us, which is on par and just as serious as an act of murder from God's holy perspective. Let us wrestle with what Jesus said, that our angry thoughts is the equivalent of murder before the God that we serve. Our thoughts, looks, and words can wish death upon a person and even kill. And such an evil is an offense and a sin committed towards God before it is even ever expressed to another person. And such sin, Jesus warns, is worthy of the fires of hell, is worthy of the wrath of God. <coughs> Before God, our thoughts of anger and hatred stand naked and judged. Some people may try to weasel their way out of God's judgment by justifying their anger and hatred and downplaying it. We might pat ourselves on the back and say, well, at least I didn't say it out loud. At least I just thought about it and never put it into action. But my dear brothers and sisters, before God, we will stand judged for every angry thought, every unspoken insult, and every ill will we wish upon someone within the secrets of our thoughts. The amplification that Jesus gives from here on out all seek to remove the wiggle room created by deceitful human hearts. Over the centuries, the rabbis and the teachers of the Jewish people thought about how to perfectly obey all of these laws of God's commandments, but create just enough wiggle room for certain things that they might be culpable for. And this is one instance where Jesus points that out to them and exposes them for who they are. Jesus seeks to destroy every human argument and reasoning that try to relieve themselves of the full burden and the liability of God's perfect commandments. And that's what he means by fulfilling. That's what he means by, I did not come to abolish the laws, but to perfect it and to complete it and fulfill it. And contrary to what some scholars may think, Jesus is not focused on semantics of words. He's not saying raka or he's not saying fool is worse than raka. He's not comparing someone who has flashy curse words to another who has more reserved insults. He's saying any, any belittling, denigrating, demeaning, and murderous thought 
or word of anger, spoken or unspoken, is a sin and will be liable to be judged by God, not by human courts. The human courts may expose you for something that someone hears, but they can't judge you for what is inside of your heart. And that's the point Jesus is trying to make. You may get away without committing murder in life and going to jail, but not before me, because any and all angry, selfish thought you harbor within your heart, that anger, the deep-seated animosity that we bear towards that person who wronged us so harshly, that person that we just can't forgive, that person that is just in, just like trenched within our hearts and we just fan that flame of anger and judgment towards that person, that anger Jesus is calling out today. John MacArthur says this, it is possible for a person who has never been involved in so much as a fist fight to have more of a murderous spirit than a serial killer. Many people in the deepest feelings of their hearts have anger and hatred to such a degree that their true desire is for the hated person to be dead. The fact that fear, cowardice, or lack of opportunity does not permit them to take that person's life does not diminish their guilt before God. Jesus is saying to us, you thought it was sufficient simply not to murder. You thought that as long as you didn't take another person's life, you'd be able to keep your hands clean. You thought that you could call yourself a good Christian for never acting on your anger, for never spouting your anger, for never letting it out and letting someone have it. And Jesus says, well, I've got news for you. Judgment awaits those who obey God's law in such a shallow manner. Judgment awaits those who only obey God's laws on the outside and not on the inside. You see, our unrighteous anger and murderous thoughts and intentions of our hearts will be judged as severely as murder itself. And I believe that is the honest interpretation of this text. It's hard to stomach, it's hard to receive, but I really believe that that's what Jesus is saying. And when you listen to what he says about lust, when you listen to what he says about other sins, I think it's fair to say that God judges us severely for our thoughts. We serve the God who desires to uproot every sinful root in our heart and purify us from the inside out. My dear brothers and sisters, if Jesus says being angry with another person puts us at risk of being thrown into the fire of hell, we best believe he's telling the truth and pay attention. So I want to urge with you this morning, I want to urge all of us, do not hold on to anger. Do not feed your resentment and your hatred towards someone else. Do not cultivate and do not let that unforgiveness take deeper and deeper root in your heart and grow and grow inside of you because it violates the number one principle of God, which is the supreme principle of love, which forgives without a condition. God's love forgives us unconditionally, and that's what we are to that's what we are to embody within our own hearts. We have to deal with our anger like our life depended on it. If we're hearing Jesus seriously, then we can't let the sun go down today while we're still angry at someone else. 
But let me just say, Jesus doesn't stop there. He has to give a little more amplification and he has to take it up a notch in terms of applications. He says, if you are going, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there and go and be reconciled, then come back. Then and only then. Then and only then is very important. Come back to give your gift to God. But notice how Jesus does not specify who is in the wrong. Someone simply has unresolved conflict, a grudge, bad blood with you. He didn't say, if you're on your way to worship God, but if you remember that you have wronged someone else and have an outstanding conflict, then go and be reconciled and make things right. He didn't say, go make things right if you were in the wrong. He said, if any brother or sister has anything against you. Anyone. I find this incredibly challenging and humbling as a Christian, as a believer. And let me just say, if my wife hadn't embraced this principle like her life depended on it, we would not be where we are today. And if my wife had only tried to resolve things and confront issues only when she was in the wrong, we would not have made it to this day, and that is my honest confession to you. I have experienced what it's like to some have someone who you've wronged, who you've hurt, who you've spouted angry words at, come to you first. And say that they're sorry for whatever they whatever pain that they may have caused you. It is incredibly humbling to have someone come to you that you've wronged. Try to make things right. And that is the power of what Jesus is saying to his disciples. If you remember that anybody has anything against you. Your priority is not to come to Sunday worship. Your priority isn't to do anything, but your priority is to go and try and make things right. Try and make peace. Your priority is to wrestle before me in secret to try and forgive that person and let go of that pain that person has caused you. And then you go and tell that person, Look them in the eye with an honest heart before me. You tell them that you forgive them through the power of Jesus Christ. And then you will experience what it's like to live out my love. I believe that when we struggle so hard at great cost to our own pride, at great cost of denying ourselves, at great cost of dying to ourselves, and we go where we've been wronged, and we go to the people who have wronged us, and we say, we forgive you. I forgive you. I don't have anything against you. And regardless of whether they take your apology and throw it out the window, regardless of whether they feel any remorse, regardless of whether they are repenting or not, before God, with a hand on heart, with an honest heart, you are able to say, Lord, I forgive that person in the name of Jesus Christ. I forgive that person. Give me the power to let go of my hatred. Give me the power to let go of my resentment. Help me not to be liable before you for judging for this judgment of others. That's what Jesus is saying to us today. And I wonder what church would be like if we had a little homework before we came to church every morning. On your way to church, if you remember, if anybody has anything against you, turn your car around and go see that person. Try to make things right. Have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation and let them know that you forgive them and walk out 
with a light heart, a burden that is unloaded before God. And let the love of God heal your heart of all of the pain and the wounds that they have caused you to this day. <clears throat> God is glorified when we do the hard work of living out his commandment in the messiest of situations in our lives, in our relationships with other people. In all situations, regardless of who is right or wrong, we are called to honor and glorify God by pursuing forgiveness and reconciliation. So let me ask you today, my dear brothers and sisters, do you have any unresolved conflicts in your life right now? Do you hold a grudge against anyone? Does anyone else hold a grudge against you for whatever reason? Do you ever entertain hateful thoughts against anyone? Is there someone you have yet to truly forgive in your life? Then listen to the words of Christ. Listen very carefully. He says, go and be reconciled. Go in the name of Jesus Christ and make things right. Go, bef go before God and wrestle with him for you, with your unforgiveness and pain. Go before God and seek his strength to forgive. Because it's not about you, it's about God. He says to us, Go and make things right. If this sounds ridiculous to you, I understand. If this sounds foolish to you and humiliating to you, I understand. If it offends you that God demands such obedience of us, it's understandable. It should. It is incredibly offensive to our pride and our selfishness. It is truly a dying to yourself when God demands such love from us towards others. But this is how the world will know that we are the children of God. This is how God intended for us to shine the light. This is how we love God. When everything is going well, when everything is going fine, and when no one has a grudge against you, and everybody is just amicable, and everybody loves you, and everybody is just so pleasant, we can worship God and be happy and content. But God demands us of resolving the messy situations of our lives. We must not allow anger and resentment to grow in our hearts today. We must not delay to make it right. We must not allow the sun to set on our anger, but immediately, as soon as we are conscious of a broken relationship, we should take the initiative to mend it regardless of who was in the wrong. Seek to resolve matters before it escalates to human courts and judges where things can get real messy. That is the practical wisdom that Jesus offers us today. What Jesus has demanded today is weighty. It is backwards from a human perspective and it may seem unfair, but please do not be discouraged. If it feels unrealistic or even unattainable, then know that you're not alone. And as we continue examining the Sermon on the Mount, I can't help but acknowledge to you there's so much more that is coming from God that is going to make us feel this little before Him, this capable before Him, that's going to make us feel like what He demands of us is nearly impossible. But it will make us realize that we are not meant to do this by our own strength. Do not forget who lives within you. Do not forget that he who has begun his righteous work within you will finish it. As you struggle to forgive someone who has wronged you out of love and obedience to God, 
He will be your shield. He will be your comfort. He will be your refuge. And He will be your reward. By forgiving with God's love, you're not dignifying your enemy's sin against you, but you're justifying the love of Christ and the price that he paid at the cross for you. Forgiveness does not release someone of their wrongdoing. Forgiveness justifies the love of God shed on the cross. There will be no worship so fragrant, so beautiful, and so glorifying to God than the cries of our hearts as we struggle to let go, forgive, and love that which seems unworthy, unforgivable, and un unchanging. Through such, such worship, God will rule over our heart in peace and joy and set our hearts free from the burden of anger, resentment, and forgiveness. Let us pray and go to God together. Father, we come to you today exposed before the words of Christ, which says, if anyone is angry against a brother or sister, they will be liable to your judgment. Lord, we stand before you with anger hidden within many different compartments of our hearts. Those places that we like to keep hidden, those places that we like to keep bottled up, those feelings and emotions that we like to keep bottled up, those places in our memories that we selectively never visit because of the pain that it causes us, because of the anger and resentment that it stirs up within our hearts. There are many places in our hearts that are in need of your healing touch and in, that are in need of the presence of Jesus Christ who is there to hold us and shield us and protect us from the many careless words, many angry words, many debasing, denigrating, belittling, many disgusting insults that we have endured in our lives without provocation, without just cause, and also the many instances in which we let our tongues loose and we hurt a brother or sister, we hurt a neighbor, we hurt a friend, we hurt a co-worker, we just let them have it and we just let them know that we were having a bad day and we just let them know that there's a lot of anger within us that is undealt with. So Lord, we come to you today. By your Spirit, will you move in our hearts and guide us towards, guide our footsteps towards those that have, that have wronged us and that we have wronged. Guide our hearts to forgive Guide our hearts to let go of the anger. Guide our hearts to go and make things right. Guide our hearts to be free before you. And this is what we pray for, Lord, this morning. I just want to invite everyone right now to spend a moment in silence before God and allow God to show you about your hidden anger, about that person about the resentment and the unforgiveness that you may still have within your hearts. Let us just sit silently before God and allow him to speak to us for a moment.
Lord, we trust that you have heard the cries of our hearts to you this morning. Help us to continue to struggle. Help us to continue to wrestle in living out your law of love, in living out your unconditional love in every relationship, in every part of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me in the prayer that our Lord's taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods? and sees a brother or sister in need, and yet refuses to help. Dear children, let us love, not in word or speech, but also in truth and action. Let's pray for these offerings. Gracious God, everything we have comes from you. You fill us with good things. Our hearts and lives overflow with your abundance. With thanksgiving, we bring to you our time, talents, and tithes. Use these gifts that you have given us to feed others as we have been fed, to serve others as we have been served, and to bless others as we have been blessed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand with me for the sending and benediction. <coughs> as you return to your daily worship, as you return to your workplaces, as you return to your homes and your families and your neighborhoods, hear now this call to discipleship. Lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of, the, of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as we were called to the one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. May the grace of God, freely given through Christ our Lord and sufficient for all our needs, and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit who testifies with our spirit that we are God's children, guide and sustain us this day and forevermore. Amen. We're glad you could join us for worship this morning. There's just a few announcements. Uh, next Sunday will be my last Sunday before our family goes on vacation to visit families, just so you're aware. However, we will continue in our regular Sunday worship. Uh, we have invited many guest uh, pastors to come and serve us uh, to lead worship during that period. Thank you.